So Paul, I've asserted that we're going to be able to use these eclipsing binaries to measure essentially how many watts they're emitting or how far away they are. How are we going to do this? Well, we know the, the radius of these things. If, if we knew the brightness per unit area of the surface, we could work out the luminosity and hence use the inverse square law to work out how far away they are. But do we know that? Well, it turns out we can find very similar stars, stars of the same color in our own galaxy. But the trouble is they're too far away to measure parallaxes. So, but if we could measure the brightness per unit area of these nearby stars, even though we can't measure the distance, we could then assume it was the same for these stars in the Magellanic Clouds and therefore get the distance. Yeah. And there is something that really helps us here, which is the concept of surface brightness. Oh, okay, so let's see. Here we have you in front of a dome, which is 10 times closer than the much bigger dome uh, that's in the background. But we always say that brightness goes as the distance squared. I know that's 10 times further away, yet that and that appear more or less the same brightness. That seems rather odd. Yeah, it is rather odd. But if you had, if you budge over a bit, you can see the uh, um, two slabs. Here we've got the Earth. Let's imagine we had two slabs, each putting out the same amount of brightness per unit area. Yep. Now, in this case, the brightness, the flux we receive on the Earth um, will go as 1 over d squared. So the further one's twice as far away, so we get only one quarter of the flux from it. So that's the inverse square law, as you imagine. That's not quite the situation we were at here, because this square, it's the same angle, but because we're looking at something further away, it's actually, that's probably only what... Uh, 50 centimeters worth of dome, whereas this is probably several meters worth of dome. So what we've actually got to consider is the angle subtended by the slab. This, this, uh, this thing here may be subtended an angle theta, that's the angle from the top to the bottom. Whereas the further one, because it's further away, subtends a smaller angle. So if you remember, we've talked many times in this course about how the angle, when it's small, is roughly given to the length divided by the distance, r over right. d. So if d is twice as big, the angle is only half as big. But that's linear angle. What you really care about is actually something we haven't talked about before called solid angle. Solid angle is basically what fraction of the total sphere something covers. So it's like an angle area. And so that's kind of like theta wide, theta down. So it's going to be like theta times theta. Yep. And so that's going to go as r squared over d squared. r squared is basically the area divided by the distance squared. Ah, so the total solid angle, that angular area, is dropping as the distance squared as well. Okay. That's right. Now we can define surface brightness as the flux per unit solid angle. And so flux obeys the inverse square law. It goes as 1 over d squared. But then so does solid angles. We've just said it also goes as 1 over d squared. So the ratio of the two, which is called surface brightness, is just going to be the flux divided by the solid angle, which is going to be um, the luminosity over r squared, neither of which depends on the distance to this thing. It just depends, on, it's just, that's just the power put out per unit area. Right. Yep. So that's all the surface brightness is. It doesn't depend how far away it is. So if you could measure the surface brightness of one of these similar stars in our own galaxy, it's going to be the same as the one in the Magellanic Cloud. No corrections needed whatsoever. That's very convenient. But how can you measure it? I mean, we can measure the flux we get from something, but we'd have to know the solid angle of a nearby star to be able to measure the surface brightness. Oh, well, this is where some new technology comes into play, where we can go through and measure very accurately nearby stars' uh, radius using interferometry. Yes, yeah, so there are a number of these experiments around the world. One of the pioneering ones was in here in Australia. Um, and the idea is you take two typically quite small telescopes separated by maybe 10 or 30 meters or something like that and they both collect the light but rather than putting it onto the detector they send it down a relay of mirrors typically into a, a vacuum chamber or an underground chamber or something like that and then they beam the two light rays to some beam combiner in a shed yeah. in between or an underground bunker or something like that and here the two lines are what are called coherently interfered with each other so you're actually looking at the interference between the waves. Yep and so you're going to have light waves coming down to one telescope, and you're going to have light waves coming down to the other telescope. And if you can get those light waves lined up so that the peaks and the troughs are the same, then you'll get this pattern of interference where you'll get bright and faint. Uh, and yeah. that's when you know you've got them lined up. 
So if all the if the star was zero size, all the light waves are going to come perfectly lined up. As the star gets bigger and bigger, some of the light waves can be coming from a very slightly different angle from the other ones, which will actually cause not quite the perfect lining up. And by seeing how imperfect this lining up is, you can actually measure the angular size, and hence the solid angle, of the stars out to actually much greater distances than you can actually measure the distances to them, or the parallaxes. Here is one of these things. This is the Very Large Telescope Interferometer in Chile. Uh, the other important ones, there's uh, one near Narrabri here in Australia. The U.S. Naval Observatory near Flagstaff in Arizona has one, and there's one at Mount Wilson, and there are various others around the world. And these combine the light. In this case, it's not from the giant telescopes in the background, usually. It's yeah. usually these little small ones that can be moved around here, bouncing the light down the tunnels, combining it and measuring the radii of the stars. So you have the radius of the star, we can measure the flux from the star, we can therefore work out the surface brightness to yep. about 3% precision. And if we know the surface brightness of the, s the similar star in our own galaxy, we can then use it to go out to the Magellanic clouds and measure the surface brightness there. So when I look at our binary things, we know the surface brightness, that's the brightness per unit area, it's going to be the same no matter how far away it is. We also know the radius of these stars because of the eclipses. So the lumen velocity is going to be the surface area times the brightness per unit area. All right, so we've now managed to take that radius measurement, convert it to a surface area, times the surface brightness, and we've measured the luminosity, which is how many watts our star is. And so we've calibrated our light bulb in an absolute sense. So when we measure how bright the object appears, we can use the inverse square law to measure its distance. Assuming there's no dust. Assuming there's no dust. So, at long last, we can get a distance for magnetic clouds, and the, the authors of this claiming about 3% precision. Yes, and this is one of the, well, the most accurate way we have to the Large Magellanic Cloud, and a way that is in comparable accuracy, it turns out, to those parallax distances measured uh, to the Milky Way Cepheids.